I'm James Graff. I'm uh, a foreign news editor at the Wall Street Journal, and I, I had the pleasure of being on the jury that, that chose the, uh, the winners of, of the immigration award that we're going to talk about tonight. And I think it's an honor, obviously, to be here. Um, and it was a real honor to, to kind of take a look at the rich body of journalism that we were allowed to take a look at. Um, um, we were given what the French people at the French American Foundation considered the cream of the crop, a much larger group of, uh, of applications. We had about 25 pieces of journalism of all sorts, some of it uh, online, some of it television, some of it print. Um, um, and our charge really was to review these pieces of journalism. These, these were from a perspective of the originality of the concept, first of all, um, the quality of the execution, but also in the spirit that, that Philippe just laid out, um, how are these people pieces reflecting concerns about social justice? And to what extent can they help inspire people, can, can they help promote, make an, a lasting impact on our ability to take these issues seriously? So what we got in these 25, um, and it was a pack of stuff like this. It took me weeks to read this journalism, I'm telling you. I, you know, I like to read novels. This was like four novels. But it was a real embarrassment of riches. And, and I think, uh, despite what everyone likes to say these days, particularly in my field about the parlous state of journalism, um, in a world that encourages triviality and that where you know attention deficit or disorder is the, is, the, is the cause of the day, so to speak, it was really quite encouraging. I think also that someone at the FAF, and I don't know if it's it's probably not a person sitting here, but whoever it is, chapeau, the very idea of creating an award specifically for journalism was, I think, extremely wise. I and mean, we didn't know. I mean, we knew that journalism was, a, or that immigration was a big deal, but if you just look around right now and see how central it is to politics in every part of the world. Um, now, in a sense, you know, I don't have to tell you, and, and Philippe has, has already told us about how, you know, we've got immigrants plunging Europe into a political crisis that we don't even know how it's going to end. We've got um, immigration marking the return of razor wire as a symbol of, of European frontiers, which it hasn't been for many, many years, decades. Um, obviously, as we all know, it's dominated politics here, uh, particularly the race for the presidential combo nomination among the Republicans, where the candidates, it's like, who's the toughest dude against immigration? It's really the whole thing. I mean, who, uh, they've been at pains to outbid each other, not only on how long and how arduous the trip to citizenship will be for the 11 million odd uh, immigrant people. Un undocumented people here in America, but but even I mean the the way to really kill the argument is that there is no path. I mean that's the real that's the real killer argument on the Republican uh, campaign right now, or so they think. And we'll see whether or not ration uh, reason prevails. But, but the point is, behind those those topical concerns, um, immigration is just a vast window on human courage and, and on human ambition, on on suffering and perseverance, and also on depravity and cruelty. Um, and I think it's those themes that the journalists that we like, that we most like, that they, they picked up those themes and, and brought them to life. So um, we gave two honorable mentions. Uh, one of them was to um, a series of print. Um, when I say print, I should say it, it, print is where it starts, but everything now has an online presence as well. Um, but it was, a, it was the Arizona Republic that put together a, a series called Pipeline of Children, a Border Crisis by Daniel Gonzalez, Bob Ortega, and, and seven other journalists and, and a few editors um, and, and photographers at the Arizona Republic. Um, I, I hope, I urge you all to, to, there are links I think on the invitation to that, I urge you all to read this. It's an absolutely fascinating, um, detailed, and really harrowing account of of the horrors that drive children to seek any way out from the threat of gang violence in, in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador particularly. And the often even greater dangers they encounter from extortionists, other kids, uh, all kinds of horrible characters on the way through Mexico, and often the massive frustration they encounter at the end of the road. Um, the journalists at the, at the Republic um, put the reader right into the desperation of these middle American communities, um, these neighborhoods. They laid out the perils that these children face when they when they ride on top of this freight train called La Bestia, the beast, the, the freight train that rolls up the, the slowly um, up the up the east coast of Mexico and has become a target for all kinds of um, vultures of the human sort, I guess, on, on these children, most of them. Um, 
they also make us feel the frustration that these kids uh, feel and, and somehow also make us understand the, the amazing fact that some of them still have hope and, 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 and find their hopes realized. Um, anyway, this, the scope and ambition of that series, I think, ought to silence anyone who says traditional journalism outlets are dead or doomed. I'm not saying that because I work at the Wall Street Journal because I haven't worked there that long. It's just kind of encouraging to see that um, that, that, was, that traditional journalism outlets can do this. and I. I don't really know anything about the finances of the Arizona Republic, but um, but I know that somebody there recognized that they had a topic of burning importance to the area of Arizona particularly, and that they had a structure in a traditional newspaper to, to support this kind of outstanding journalism. Um, you can't get this kind of reporting by sending somebody out on spec and saying, give us a story about immigration. This is a structure that takes editors, it takes planning, it takes money up front, and those structures need to be supported, and, and I think it's great that the FAF is, is doing its part to do that. Also earning an honorable mention uh, is uh, Displacing the DR in Harper's Magazine by Rachel Nolan, who's right here. Hope you said hello. Give her a hand. Um, her written story lays out the historical origins and the surreal consequences of what's known in the Dominican Republic as the sentence which was a high court decision two years ago that essentially declared more than 200,000 people there in the Dominican Republic stateless um, simply because of their Haitian origin. A lot of these people had been born, well, all these people had been born in the Dominican Republic. Many of their parents had been born in the Dominican Republic. Um, the, the Rachel story is a, is a fascinating look at um, also how race is constructed. I mean, we see it in the Dominican Republic in a very different way than we do here, but it shines a very, I think, very interesting light on the way we construct our racial categories here in the U.S. Um, as she pointed out, um, the people in the Dominican Republic who hate the Haitians because they are black and because they are white, uh, these people, they come to the U.S. and find out that they're black in the, in the perspective of the Americans and suddenly get another side of the story. So it's, it's a really interesting, and I, I urge you to, to read it, uh, a story about, about, about the whole the whole thing, and also about American complicity, I think, to some degree, in the way the Dominican Republic developed that way. Um, um, Rachel did her, her work as a freelancer, um, but again, we have a story brand in American journalism, Harper's Magazine. It's probably one of the oldest existing magazines, I think, in America still, isn't it? I mean, it's been around for since the abolitionists um, in New England, I guess. Um, you know, it put up the cash. It, it, um, it, offered editorial guidance, it had fact checkers help her out, and that's what makes this fine work possible, um, I think, to some degree. Uh, Rachel was a full-time journalist before she decided to pursue a PhD in Latin American history, um, and we're glad that she could resist, they couldn't resist the temptation to return to journalism, and I'm pretty sure she's not going to be one that's going to hold up in an ivory tower, maybe for the rest of her life. Um, finally, um, this year's FAF Immigration Journalism Award goes to Mary Sacchetti, Maria Sacchetti of the Boston Globe for her piece, The Unforgotten. Maria is right there. Uh, an absolutely a searing picture of the injustice and the human effort to, to address it played out in rural Texas. Maria started with a simple disconnect, as she told me earlier today. A Salvadoran woman in Boston, Maria Intariano, had, had a broken off series of texts uh, that made her fear that her brother Santos had, had gone missing, but she couldn't report him missing. The structures didn't exist to do so. Um, that thread led her to this macabre tableau in Brooks County, Texas, where the bodies of more than 400 immigrants in this one county alone have turned up dead. The bodies have turned up uh, since 2009 um, because it's part of this bestia pathway and all the rest of coming up the East Coast. Um, this county didn't have the, doesn't have the means or the expertise to handle these bodies, let alone identify them. The long, as, as Maria tells the story, and again, I hope you read it, she, she shows us this unbelievable bureaucratic catch-22 that essentially drains these people of their personhood. Um, and she also introduces us to a crew of volunteer forensic scientists uh, and students that are doing the thankless and heartbreaking work of, of, um, of helping them, of restoring a kind of belated personhood, if you will, to these people that that have had it taken away from them. Um, and also, I think she tells us a lot about the pain of waiting and of not knowing that it plagues so many relatives that uh, of people that take this journey north that, that, that doesn't ever end. So 
I want to ask Maria to come up here with my congratulations, and she's going to tell you more. So thank you very much. I'm used to listening, not speaking, so thank you in advance for your patience. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Boston Globe, I'd like to profoundly thank the French American Foundation um, for this award. For the, I'd like to thank the judges and the funders. Um, it's a very generous award, and it means um, a great deal to the newspaper, but also to me personally. Um, I'd also like to thank my father and my aunt for being here with me, so thank you for accommodating me. So, through this award, your fellowships, and the other work that you do, I, I feel like the foundation is, is really encouraging this deeply meaningful journalism. And it helps support us as journalists in arguing that this is the kind of work that needs to be done. So in our story, The Unforgotten, we documented the hundreds and, and really possibly thousands of people who are dead or missing after crossing the US-Mexico US border. I mean, of course, they're, they're missing on both sides, but this is happening on, on American soil. Um, in this one case, I, um, I was introduced to a woman named Maria Antediano, and she's been looking for her brother since June 2013. So to this day, she has not been able to get a police department to uh, take a missing persons report for him. Uh, she, uh, she, she tried uh, three different police departments, and they all said, well, we don't know where he went missing, so we can't take a report. No one would look for him. So she went to an advocate, and they came to the newspaper. Um, without a police report, you can't, it's very, very difficult to get your DNA into a system. So there are hundreds of human remains found along the border. But without a match, no one can know who, what their name is, who they were, and they can't mourn them. No one will ever know what happened to them. So without a police report, you can't get the DNA test. Um, when I first started reporting this, it almost didn't seem real. I mean, this is a country, um, the United States of America, where we agreed to identify dead enemy soldiers because that's the right thing to do. There are enemies, and we there was a process for identifying them, and we do not have that for migrants crossing the border to cook and clean and care for children. Um, again, I, I really I was a bit skeptical when I first started doing doing this, but Maria, who is who is undocumented, um, has been very courageous. She's had the FBI in her house. She would tell anyone she's desperate to find her brother Santos, and has not been able to do it. Without her showing me, I wouldn't know these stories. Um, so I want to tell you what happened after our story ran. After we reported this, Maria got her DNA into the FBI system. A possible match was found on, to a skull found along the border just, just after he disappeared. And then days before the police were preparing to search that site again to try to find clues or something that could say definitively that it was him, her brother Santos, Maria got a call from a stranger, and he told her that Santos was alive. So, and for a price, she could get him back. Now, I was in Europe covering the refugee crisis, and uh, she called me, and I was somewhere, and I missed her call, and uh, the family cobbled together the rent money, the food money, they were very poor, and, um, and they wired uh, all together at the end uh, more than $3,000, which is a ton of money for, for me, and it's a ton of money for them. Um, to a man in Mexico, and uh, they said, they told her that her brother was on his way, and then their phones went dead, and of course she did not see him again. You think, oh, you know, how, how could she not know it was a scam, these, these scams are so common, but in those same days, one of the money transfer services told me that families from Texas, Kansas, and Maryland sent money to the same man in Mexico. So this is something that is affecting families very far from the border in places like Boston. It's affecting people all over the United States. I don't think I really understood um, until all this developed how prevalent this, these scams are, but also how many people are looking for the missing. Through Maria, I found out that because they can't file police reports, because they can't get their DNA into the system, their immigrants are taking to the internet by the tens of thousands and posting missing persons reports in Spanish on Facebook pages. And they're posting pictures, details about their loved ones, and their cell phone numbers, which is uh, exactly what scam artists need to call them. 
And so, and that is happening over and over and over again. And as often happens with immigrants, um, if they're, they're not getting out into the mainstream news and this isn't getting out there, then um, it's very, very quiet and we don't know about it. So thanks to Maria, we, we do. Um, and, uh, and so looking at these pages, uh, according to the officials, at least the Border Patrol people will say, well, there's, there's hundreds of bodies that are unidentified um, and hundreds missing. But you look at these pages and you can see that it's many, many more than that. Um, some people are undocumented, so they're afraid to go to the police. But some, like Maria, who are undocumented, aren't afraid. They're just desperate to find their brothers and sisters and sons. I received a call I mentioned earlier um, from a woman in Ohio whose 16-year-old son is missing. And she kept telling me she's here legally, and I couldn't understand why she thought that mattered. But then I realized that she thought an American like me wouldn't care to listen to her if she didn't have a work permit, even though her boy is missing. So, um, and, and this, you know, we were able to document this. When I first started working on this, I thought there would be a paper trail, there would be reports, I'll be able to really report on this. And of course, we did verify with the Salvadoran government that he was missing, we did do our due diligence. But to have hundreds of possibly thousands of people missing on U.S. soil, and it's not part of the presidential debate, it's not even a talking point even for the major immigrant groups that call me pitching stories. Um, that says to me that it's an issue that's easy to ignore. And, um, and that's why this recognition means so much to me. Thank you.